It's the Monday before Christmas, 1983, and my mom leads my dad by the arm towards the front door with my five-year-old brother and me following behind out of curiosity. She yells, surprise! As she opens the door, removes my dad's blindfold, my brother and I strain our necks around their adult legs to try to see what was going on. And outside of our house is a brand new Datsun 280ZX. It's golden mist, which is how automobile, automobile manufacturers say brown. <laughs> it has the optional T-top roof, and as we would say in the 80s, a bitchin' set of aftermarket sheepskin seats. <laughs> My mom used to crush Christmas. She crushed our whole childhood, really. One, uh, one other Christmas morning, years later, my brother and I, we awoke to find that we had received everything on our Christmas list. Four hours later, as we lay exhausted in a pile of shredded wrapping paper and discarded plastic clamshells, my brother and I, gently nudged by our mother, realized that all these material things, they didn't make us any happier than we'd been in preceding years. In fact, it just gave us more to fight over. The real value is now, as we lay our heads in our parents' laps on the couch telling stories. It's just like my mom to teach us this lifelong lesson about the spirit of Christmas by buying us everything we wanted. But this Christmas was all about my dad. Life's too short, she said. You should have a cool car. <laughs> it's the very first brand new car my dad will ever own. And the three of us, we clamor out to pour over every detail. My brother explores the back seat. I grab the manual from the glove box to try to figure out how to get the T-tops off. And my dad wipes the morning dew from the hood with a chamois. My brother and I were off school for Christmas break, so my mom was forcing my dad to take us to work with him. Now, if my dad had had a normal job, that would have been drudgery, but my dad was a sportscaster. So his work involved things like interviewing Muhammad Ali at his home or hanging out on the field before the game at Dodger Stadium fetching Reggie Jackson or Oral Hershiser for my dad to interview. It was pretty cool. So there we are, winds in our hair, the T-tops are stowed in the, in the trunk. We're going to the beach to interview Mark Richards, an Australian surfing champion. The beach in question is somewhere between 20 minutes and nine and a half hours away, depending on LA traffic. So as is my dad's custom, we stop at 7-Eleven for drinks. My dad gets a big gulp of Mountain Dew and I a cherry Slurpee, which is also what my brother wanted. Now at this point, my dad belatedly realizes that maybe having a five-year-old in the back seat of his brand new car with a enormous cup of bright red cherry stain is not the best idea in the world, so he told my brother no. Now, this is patently unfair. My dad and I both have drinks. I have the exact same drink that my brother wants. My brother, always a schemer, he doesn't cry, he doesn't throw a tantrum. He knows from watching me that that stuff only backfires. He just, he just got sad. I couldn't stand it. I tell my dad, I'll vouch for him. Like a seven-year-old boy vouching for a five-year-old is some kind of silver bullet. <laughs> but it works. He stares at us. and His resolve starts to crumble. And we look back with our enormous eyes and our pathetic, pleading faces. We've won. We just have to wait it out until it's official. 
Now it's tense when we get back into the car, but as my brother starts climbing over the passenger seat, settling into the back, we realize how careful he's being. In fact, as I'm climbing into the front seat, my own cup begins to tip over. <laughs> my dad reaches out and he steadies my hand and he gives me a stern look, tells me everything I need to know about my fate <laughs> if I spill this drink. It's not worth it. I'm terrified that I'm going to be the one to ruin my dad's brand new car on its very first drive. I'm sure my brother is too. It makes it impossible to enjoy the drink or the car ride. But eventually, with time, we settle into a good rhythm. We start to enjoy the drive again. We're listening to 102.7 KISS FM. <laughs> the wind, it's in our hair. The drinks are mostly gone. It's going to work out. So when we finally pull in to the parking lot at the beach, my dad parks the car. We open the doors. We start filing out. We hear this sweet, soft, innocent voice. It's my brother. He's still in the back seat. He says, Dad, can I have a towel? You know, I told that story for maybe the thousandth time at a Christmas dinner 12 years later. <laughs> it was an impossibly somber occasion because we were surrounded by friends and family and we were coming to terms with the fact that my mom had just been diagnosed as terminal from the cancer that she'd been fighting for two years. It'd be the last Christmas we'd ever spend together as a family because for us, she was the spirit of Christmas. I told the story. And we erupted into a catharsis of laughter. Tears of laughter ever so slightly diluting the ones of sorrow that we'd been accumulating kicked off this cascade of reverie, the time in second grade when I was playing let's spit drinking water at each other with my friend after school in the schoolyard and accidentally I spit all over this sixth grader who proceeded to just beat me senseless while his enormous ape-like enforcer held my arms behind my back. My mom, who was early to pick me up for the first time in either of our lives, <laughs> descends upon them with this banshee wail, an avenging angel sprinting across the concrete in her high heels, her car double parked, keys in the ignition, the driver door ajar. And the night my dad came home at two o'clock in the morning after work, he was driving a friend's pickup truck and he excitedly wakes up the entire house. You gotta see this! by which he meant 600 pounds of squealing, squelching, squirming pig in the, in the bed of the borrowed pickup truck. He would brought it home to live with us. <laughs> My mom simply tightened the neck of her nightgown, went back to bed. <laughs> One of our friends who hadn't heard the story about the car and the Slurpee the towel, asked my mom how she reacted when we got the car back, and she saw that her boys had ruined it after only four hours. <laughs> after thinking about it for a few seconds, she said, I don't remember. Life is short. You can't spend your time worrying too much about things. We laughed, man. Even as that 1983 Datsun 280ZX itself rusted in nothing in a junkyard with an enormous cherry red seam stain defiling the back left seat. But I'll tell you, 
we'd have given a thousand of those cars for that one evening. We still would. Shortly before she died, while she could still get around, I, I was driving my mom to the train station to pick up my brother. And she'd, uh, she asked me to roll the window up. I didn't want to. I flew into this rage. I responded with all the hate, vitriol, and spite that I could muster in my 20-year-old breast about a window. It's one of the last conversations we ever had. And I sat in this car in this miserable contentment, feeling like I had succeeded in damaging her by being ugly as much as she damaged me by being sick. She just looked at me. Her eyes kind of misted up with tears. And she just took my hand. Life's too short, she said. Tomorrow, tomorrow is my birthday. And I'll be turning the same age she was when she died. A few months from now, I'll be older than she ever got to be before she was called away. And I think about that a lot, because I still feel like her child. I'm not a religious person, but I feel like she's always watching over her boys, a group that has grown now to include my family. Her memory kind of guides me as I officiate a battle about which kid gets to play with what tablet, or as I, against all instincts, respond with compassion as my five-year-old screams in my face out of frustration because it's time to brush his teeth. She's there, reminding us always that life is too short to worry about spilt cherry slurpee. Thanks for listening. Sean Dawson, ladies and gentlemen. Sean Dawson.